Okay, so the recording started. I'll do that again. <laughs> okay. uh, call, call to order the Town of Superior Transportation and Safety Committee meeting for August 3rd. Okay. okay. No, we've got a lot on the agenda, so why don't we go ahead and I'll turn it to you to get us started. All right. I don't see anybody from the public, so we can skip over item two. Um, but uh, item three is the bike lane, bike lane striping committee recommendations. And I do see Alicia Zimmerman joining us. There she is. Okay. Hi, Alicia. How you doing? And I'm going to actually, let's see, turn it over to her. Okay, Alicia is going to present the uh, uh, recommendations of the Bike Lane Striking Committee. So as you uh, re recall, a number of meetings ago, uh, the TSC asked that we bring some bis bicycle experts. Uh, convene a group to look at our signing and striping practices for, for bike lanes. So uh, here's the committee that we pulled together on recommendations of the county and the sheriff's office. Alexander Phillips, who's actually the Kent Boulder County bicycle planner. Uh, Matt Muir, who you met with Cycles for Community. Jack Todd was with Bicycle Colorado, and he was, he's the senior communication policy manager. Alicia is with Fox Tuttle, but she's also a, a NACTO certified bicycle design trainer. And Bill Fox also attended uh, the meeting. So we had a couple of meetings and uh, Alicia, can you take it from there? Sure. Um, I'm gonna deal with that a headset until the herd comes home and I might have to switch if it's too noisy. So um, as Alex mentioned, we he put together this committee and um, Considering there were three Alex's on it, he figured that I'd do with the, as maybe a substitute for Bill tonight since I'm Alicia and pretty close. So um, I think you've met everybody else on here. Um, we had two committee meetings. I think they were what, end of June and beginning of July about. Um, so this is our kind of our next steps. And the things that we talked about were basically things like turn, turn line lengths, acceleration and taper lengths, use of green paint, and we focused a lot on the Indiana Street intersection in particular, given that it was a particular area of concern, but could also be kind of, you know, looked at um, as an indicator of the other intersections that were be being considered. And then a few uh, additional one-off connection locations as well. Um, we talked through some of the issues and potential solutions, which I'll go through in a second. Um, and then also the best practices and what the industry is doing in many of the ins instances and you'll find that a few of them are instances where the industry is just struggling with it and there's not an obvious answer and so we've proposed some short and long-term solutions that we think are best for those locations um the guides just for reference that we kind of talked through and you know figured out what applied the best were things like highway design manual um the FHWA bike, to, bike guide, and there's a new one coming out. And so we kind of have some inside information on what might be in that, which will apply to this, as well as um, NACTO. Um, and I don't know if you all have talked about NACTO on this call before, um, but it's basically, it's, a, it's an organization that has started looking at more urban type roadway, focusing on multimodal standards well, not standards, guidelines, um, because the nature of guideline of standards in this country has been so rural and highway focused. And so it's kind of shifting. Right. Um, and I think that's it. So you just, Alex, you want me to dig into the recommendations in the memo that we put yes, together? Yes, sure. Mm -hmm. okay. So we put this t memo together that basically summarized what we talked through. And it broke for McCaslin and Indiana specifically, it broke it down into some near-term recommendations and some long-term recommendations. Um, the near-term recommendations were kind of the more obvious, what do we fix right now? Um, but what came up was we can't ignore the potential for some longer-term recommendations uh, 
you know, given funding, given time, that would be better improvements here. Um, and so the near-term recommendations that we talked through, and I guess I'll pop over to this um, diagram here. Okay. So can everybody see my screen with Indiana and McCaslin yep. on it? Yep. Um, the near-term recommendations we talked through, and I'll give an overview and you, go, you all can ask questions, are a goal of shortening the exposure of bicyclists along here in between the through lane and the right turn lane southbound. It's a little hard to see here, but you can see that the dash line is back here and the right turn lane is really, really long and the bicyclist would be in between those two at on a 45 mile an hour roadway, more likely, you know, 55, 60 at least through there. Um, so shortening that turn lane length right here, which is the 240, and shortening the taper length or the transition length, which is the 200. And then in that transition, giving the green striping, this shows black bars on the outside, but it's really white. It's just the way we show it on an aerial here. Um, and shortening those to lengths that are more, uh, that are currently indicated as potentially being shown in FHW, new FHWA guidance that isn't out yet as well as basically trying to do the minimum that, uh, um, you know, that Excel decel requirements would allow. And that's, those are kind of up to interpretation as well. Talked about potentially adding this sign here, turning vehicles yield to bikes, and that would be for uh, southbound left turners going up the hill, um, turning onto Indiana, um, just to make them aware. And also adding some um, green, you know, green dashes um, through here so that those southbound left turners are aware that they're crossing a bicycle facility. And I know that this is the, the location where the crash history is most concerning. Um, potentially modifying um, or installing what we call Porktop Island here to both allow folks to proceed out a little bit further to be able to see better and to get better visibility of those bicycles and also increasing the, the right turner so that they can kind of see what's, uh, sorry, moving them forward so that they can kind of see what's going on as well. Um, and then similarly on the, what would be considered the right turn XL lane in taper, um, reducing those distances as well. You can see over here that this is where the dash is currently with the white dashing and changing that to some, some green um, dashes. The, I I think that Which covered question, right is the pork chop a do you see that painted or do you see that raised we showed it as raised um i've seen them being done painted they call it paint and post so you would you would both paint it and put you know flex posts up or something um but i think it depends on you know timing and the concrete contractor and all that stuff as well from a point um, of view i just worry a lot of these psychos by the time they hit that you know it's not quite the downhill but they're still going potentially 30, 34 miles an hour right. there. A concern, of, and it's, you know, this is a big focus. This intersection has been a big focus for us because of the, the accident data. Do you or anybody on the committee have a point of view around whether or not those pork chop islands are, maybe have the unintended consequence if you just put a barrier in front of a, somebody with a pretty narrow tire yeah, going 30 miles I an hour? I'd like to um, hear everybody else's thoughts as well, but the goal here would be to pull the pork chop island back far enough that there's a little bit of buffer between the outside edge of that um, bike, you know, the bike marked bike lane and the curb of the pork chop island. So, you know, it might be even five feet there. So it's almost like doubling the width, but marking the bikeway away from the pork chop island. Right. Yeah, we did, we debated this. Uh... Uh, extensively in terms of do we need to have the pork chop or not if you don't have it then you have a stop sign kind of sitting out in the middle of no of the pavement we probably have delineated some some way of protecting that stop sign um, I think the consensus of the committee was to put the pork chop in and provide adequate separation but we wanted to uh, to run that by you uh, um, certainly that's not a major issue whether we put it in or not it could always re be removed down the road um, again we wanted to get the vehicles to pull forward as far as they can to increase the, the visibility 
Matt, did and you we, have any uh, comments on that? Well, before, and no reason why the pork chop, if we did do the pork chop island, it, presumably we could do the, you know, not the hard three inch curb, but the softer rounded curb, presumably. Yeah, right, okay. kind of a, a mountable. Right, exactly. Right. Wouldn't be ideal, but it wouldn't be immediate, it wouldn't be an immediate endo, it would be, you know, you might be able to navigate through it if you hit it as a cyclist. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. The with one that. thing I want to tell you, right now on this corner, um, the, I'm trying to think even how to describe this corner. <laughs> um, the corner where we have the turning vehicle sign on the map. Um, yes, right there. That one, I find whenever I'm either driving it or even like running around that area, it's kind of hard to delineate between the road and the curb because it's almost the same color. So I think even if we do the, even if we do kind of the soft entry, I think we, we should make sure that we're at least making a different color concrete or whatever, so that it's very clear um, when people are on the road or on the sidewalk. Because I've seen people go up and over quite a bit, which you don't get a ton of pedestrian anymore, but it could be something else. Good, good point. Uh, Alicia or even Matt, just a question, you know, on the sort of the, I guess the northbound side, you know, one of the issues I think I've seen, and a lot of Colorado drivers probably do this as well, is they don't use the entirety of the acceleration lane. They sort of merge too soon, right? So in the sense that the mixing lane is identified 250 feet after you exit Indiana, but potentially the drivers are crossing over that much, much earlier. Have you ever increased the green to overlap with the, the acceleration lane? And I always say this because, you know, I, every time I've come out, you know, from that area, um, you know, rarely do people have to use the entirety of the acceleration. Like, exactly. Like that area there is, I think, where most people actually merge onto Indiana. And it's not, you know, it, like every one of the, the sheets that you have in here, you know, whether it's merging on from Rock Creek Parkway onto, I'm sorry, from Rock Creek Park Parkway onto McCaslin, rarely does anyone use the entirety of the acceleration lane. They, they often just you know, swerve right in. Um, because I think they can. Uh, I think humans are a terrible judge of speed and distance. So I think everyone just tries to get in quickly because they think they have to. And, and unfortunately, um, you know, you don't see those green hash marks until much later. And it's just a really more of a curiosity as to whether or not they can overlap or, not, or if that's more confusing. They, well, we wanted, we wanted to, uh, we had a compromise here because the access code says to make the, uh, acceleration lane that long, but I agree, uh, vehicles just don't use that long a lane. So we we cut it down quite a bit. Um, whether we did enough or not um, remains to be seen, but I, I think we wanted to to shorten it, definitely shorten it. And but I think that's also part of the problem that we're trying to solve with this stripe and that we will solve with this striping is right now that doesn't even appear to be an access lane. Um, it, right now, when you are turning from Indiana and taking a right onto McCaslin, it looks like you're supposed to go into the single lane and it looks like that access lane is just kind of random pavement, not a lane. So I think we'll solve for that quite a bit just by just by putting in the appropriate line. I don't think we need to go to barriers or anything like that. I think let's start with just making it clear that that's where you're supposed to turn, which I don't think anybody knows right now. Yeah, and go back to your the graphic, Alicia. The uh, we did add it, an extra line that doesn't exist today. The the outside, yeah, right. That line doesn't exist. So we've added that exactly. and, and added the arrow to, to show this is where you want to go. And I think that'll help tremendously. Uh -huh. And Neil, to your point, oh, I lost it. Keep in mind that the um, that the XL lane right now it is, you know, really long and the okay. dashes are really long. So it feels like they're cutting over pretty early and but it may we may hit it with this right here, or it may just be a little early. Oh, um, okay. I, okay, that's a good, that's a really good yeah, point. So, so the if the acceleration lane today is here. two times longer than it needs to be, then, okay, then we may actually solve it just by, you know, I gotcha, okay. And these, these distances, 200, around 200 are um, what's potentially being proposed in this new FHWA guide that's coming out. 
And so the good thing about that is not only do we think this is probably how it will operate, but there's guidance that, you know, outside of that that says these are about the right length as well. Okay. Perfect. Neil, were you asking about making the green paint wider? So each skip stripe would be? No, um, okay. although that's, that's intriguing too. Um, more of, you know, there's a 250 foot, or I'm sorry, 240 foot acceleration lane. But, you know, what I was, what I was not thinking about is right now the acceleration lane is significantly higher than 240 feet. But, you know, bear with me in the sense that a lot of drivers may, you know, be able to accelerate to 45 miles an hour and 100 feet, in which case, you know, they're, they're motivated to move across and into the prior, the, the normal lane of traffic, you know, and, and prior to the zone of where they should, how do you cue that driver that's merging sooner that this is a mixing lane? Yeah. Well, it, if, if I can, too, we can move it up a little bit and the, it'll be obvious the bike lane symbol being about where they're thinking about merging might help as well. Oh, I think that that's a great idea. Sure. Yeah. I'm in agreement with everything so far. Um, Laura, I thought your comment about the color pavement mixing with the neighboring soils is actually interesting. Um, Boulder County is looking at one of these pork chops right now on J Road. And one of the things they're gonna do is they're gonna shrink the pork chop because it impinges upon a bikeable shoulder right now. So the bicyclists come in to a, a flat intersection. There's no, um, hill for a descending cyclist to allow them to reach the speeds that um, Kevin's talking about. But already we're going to talk about shrinking that pork chop because the bicyclist comes in and gets pushed over um, closer into the auto lanes. Hey, but this is Troy. Sorry, I had to join the meeting late. I had a quick comment. Can anybody hear me? Yep, we can hear you, Troy. So from the pork chop, as you're heading north until you get to the mixing lane, would it be possible to put some sort of a, I don't know, I've seen them almost like a fiberglass, you know, kind of a wavy type thing that would designate along that stretch right the cars and the bikes? A bollard. Yeah, bike rail kind of is similar to what you're thinking, that there's wave versions of a bike rail. Um, I'll leave that answer up to Alex. The places, <laughs> most of those are put in more urban, lower speed conditions, but. Right, right there. This is more a cross between a, a high speed rural and urban. It's really rural coming down. You, We have such pretty high speeds coming down there, both from, by the bikes and by the, by the vehicles. Uh, but Troy, I'll, uh, I'll get with you later to get your ideas on that and whether that would make, make sense. I'd hate to add, add any physical. Um, sure, I, I get that. And the other suggestion I was just gonna say, and you see this one merge arrow that you have down there. What about right. one further back that just is a straight arrow that indicate to keep going straight down to the mixing uh -huh. side? Yeah. Yeah, the don't merge arrow. Don't merge too soon, yeah. So that's all my comments right now. Good. Good. I like the green paint though. Thanks. Yeah, I think this is, I, I think this is great. Matt, I was trying to ask you a question, I was on mute. Is there any, anything on here from your advocacy perspective that didn't make the list or any concerns with anything you're seeing here? I mean, this is, I'm thrilled that we had this committee um, you know, there's shorter term things and longer term, and ideally we would magically have an island installed or a, a roundabout installed there tomorrow, but time and cost prevents that. So we want these intermediate solutions. Do you see any other intermediate solutions that we should be considering? I agree with your evaluation and I can't really add anything to it. Uh, I also, I commend um, Alicia. They've, we've walked through this process. We've had good deliberation, good consensus, and agreed upon recommendations, and they match what you just said. It'd be great if budgets and practicalities were unlimited, but they're not. 
right? But a couple of things we didn't think of previously. I mean, I love the green striping right on the intersection. I love the idea of a sign yield to cyclists coming down the hill, which they should be anyway, but just for somebody that might not be familiar with the, how many cyclists we have in the community, it's a great, great idea. I, I'm thrilled with this. The, the sign, let's explain that sign because it's really for the left turning vehicles. Right. Yep. Okay. Yeah, so it's it's for the north or for the uphill vehicles yielding to downhill bicycles. Is the downhill bicycles, I think, Kevin, was what you were referring to. And the biggest thing here is that you're, you're doing as much as you can to explain to people, people bicyclists are going to be coming and they're going to be coming at a faster speed than you're expecting. You know, okay. there's not a sign that says that, but we do as much as we can with that. Yeah. Okay. Alicia, why don't you, uh, since we had this worked out, we wanted to at least look at all of the McCaslin intersections. So just page through those uh, to, yeah. to show that we, uh, we, we also looked at Calmonte. So a similar uh, treatment here kind of kept the 200, the 200 and 240 lengths unless, unless it was already shorter. So the same kind of uh, treatment on at Kilmonte and then up uh, Christensen. Yep. The yep. ridge. My planes. Perfect. And it, let me note that high planes is um yeah, that's high planes, yeah. Yeah, is you know, is the opposite in terms of we're dealing with the downhill left turners. Um, but it, you know, so most of the same considerations and this one is, is delineating exactly where that right turn lane would start coming from a more urban condition rather than coming from the more rural. Right. Well, we and, you're still, and from a best practice perspective, it's still, I mean, we're shortening the amount of time between the bike lane, but I still, I still get a little anxious every time you're there's a cyclist potentially to the left of me if I'm turning right. I, I'll just, to be honest, and I know I probably make the cyclist crazy because they don't know my intent, but I will literally slow down and go behind the cyclist because I don't want to be next to them or pass them. That's still a, from a roadway perspective, that's a best practice, not to move over the bike lane. Yeah, I think the biggest difference is, oh, okay, so, so, Standard wise, everywhere that I know of right now, you actually aren't allowed to have a, a, through, a through bike lane to the right of a dedicated right turn. Okay. So the only way you can do that is to make it a shared bike lane and right turn lane, which means okay. that everybody has to merge no matter what. And some people are more comfortable with that, but most bicyclists say, even though I'm in between the cars, I'd rather have my own space. So that's right. why I left. Okay. And can we go to the striping on the roundabout? Oh, yeah, we can, uh, let's... Uh, we'll we'll get to it, but, but okay. before, yeah, just the Rock Creek Parkway. Oh, okay. We struggle with this one because we had bike lanes on both Rock Creek Parkway and on McCaslin, and how you um, get the bike, bike, you know, a lot of bicyclists are coming up Rock Creek Parkway and turning on to, to uh, McCaslin in either direction, so how do you do that. Um, so there's, there are a lot of issues here that we kind of said, well, let's put them on, uh, let's set them aside until let's get these done first on the Caslin, come back to Rock Creek Parkway with a, a plan that, that treats bikes a little differently than what's happening out there now. Okay. And so then this, this basically takes the same you know, treatments and applies it to a signalized intersection um, with the exception of those locations that are already less for, you know, the right turn lane. And from a multimodal perspective, this is even more inviting, but, um, you know, is defensible primarily because that's what's out there already. So, but you can tell, for example, northbound coming out of Rock Creek is shortened, just like many of the others. And then there's going to be, you know, some additional space in here. So. Okay. Huh? All right. So this one was in response to, but we can't ignore what the ideal condition here would be. Um, we know that it it's 
a bigger project for many reasons, um, you know, engineering, planning, engineering, and financial. And so, but we wanted to document what it might look like. Connection up here to 128, um, you know, could, could have many configurations, could have a study in and of itself, but just saying it's going to connect up here at 128. We have some kind of roundabout here, which you all are no stranger to at Indiana. The roundabout here would allow um, those, you know, wanting to turn left off of Indiana or get across, um, even get across up to, you know, Colton, trailhead up here, to get across at an intersection where vehicles are by default required to slow down. And so, you know, a much more comfortable crossing there to um, a separated or as separated as possible given the slopes and everything to a shared use path type facility. And so we show that connection all the way down, um, you know, past multiple of the other um, locations up to Colton Road and potentially using, you know, the underpass there to be able to connect both this direction and up to the um, northeast and also over to the trailhead as well. Some of the basic or objective data on bicycle facilities show that at a certain volume or auto speed, you just need a separated bicycle facility. These are challenging long-term goals. They're not easy and they're expensive. There is kind of a wildly important or long distance or uh, long-term goal. Jeffco is talking about, and I think may have initial funding to bring a separated path from Golden to Boulder. And if you can improve facilities along the 128 McCaslin corridor, it would result in significant regional connectivity. Matt, so in, fa in fact, fact just, me, just, just a quick question. Is that just along Highway 93 up until they hit Boulder County? Boulder County has told me that Jeffco is working on a Highway 93 bike bicycle facility, a bikeway. Okay. I, don't have good sources in Jeffco. That's not because they don't exist. It's just I don't have one. Okay. But when we first started talking about this intersection, I explained the one accident we had. The actual it really came from the committee. Put a roundabout there. Uh, that would really slow traffic down and provide a, a much safer way to get through the intersection, uh, and especially making left turns from Kazan to Indiana. Uh, making left turns out of Indiana, um, so was there suggested. And then we then we talked about regionally whether this this connection we've never had on our plan, um, and whether that would be something that maybe we should consider. You know, when we do our transportation plan update. And just speaking as the uh, the rep for the Parks and Rec committee, you're having a path along McCaslin at this chunk is like one of the, the sort of most sought after connections in our you know town trail network because we've got you know goofy top topology on the east side so you know I appreciate you guys putting this out there because there's no way from anybody in this part of the community to get down to the trailhead without you know going backwards and then forwards um, so this is this is a great solution I, I want to try to find it you now right, go move forward so I did want to check on that um, and the reason for kind of the west side versus the east side of McCaslin. Um, it's the ravine. <laughs> I, well, and I ask because usually when I run along there, I typically run on the east side, not the west side. Um, so there is, I know there's a ravine once you actually get into like the grass part. But there's also like quite a wide stretch of pavement in between the car lane and the actual ravine. So I, I personally would love to see maybe it's a multi-use path on the west side and a sidewalk on the east side. Um, but it, to me, it feels like, from a layman's perspective, it feels like there is room to do something on the east side as well. Yeah, Laura, on the east side, I know we've done some alignment studies and uh, we've uh, done some cost estimates. Uh, to do that. There are, there are some challenges. Mm -hmm. there's, there's some pretty steep uh, drainages there that you oh, sorry. have to... so, I mean from Haslin, so, so from Indiana to the existing roundabout, not going further up the hill, but just, yeah, in that area. 
Right. Yeah. That's where we've we've done our studies. We really haven't gone to the south of Indiana, but north of Indiana to Colton. We've done we've done alignment studies and cost estimates on that. Um, okay. It's pretty expensive because of the drainage okay. uh, crossings that we have. Got it. Well, yeah, I mean, that said, I'm very supportive of the plan that's out there. I mean, I think a roundabout there would make a huge difference. Um, and it certainly then makes it easier for people to cross over to the west side and proceed from there. There are lower volume crossings on the west side as well, although Tomente is, you know, probably your only concern, up, at least up to Colton. Um, but it's a, a little bit freer stretch without those, the Indiana crossing and the Calmonte crossing, but. So this part is really just, we're, this is presented as longer term, something to, to consider. I don't think, I mean, it's a great idea. I don't think we'd really looked at I haven't seen anything that has that west side multi-use path. So I think it's a really good idea. Um, and frankly, it may just get, I mean, I'm amazed. I, I don't know what the original intent of the 36 bikeway was. I wasn't part of that, but I imagine it would be, you know, families and casual cyclists. And frankly, you see obviously the hardcore cyclists out there using that every day, which makes me nervous because they go so flipping fast, but I think this could be, you know, we could move the hardcore cyclists into this multi-use path off of a very heavily traveled McCasland Boulevard. I think it's a really good idea. All right, so we want to put that out there. And then on the uh, short-term recommendations, we've uh, sent those to our contract striper that we just awarded a couple of weeks ago, asked them to price out uh, doing uh, doing the striping this year. Um, so we'll get prices, uh, I'd like at least to get Indiana done, but we'll have prices to do all those intersections and then make a decision to see whether we can fit in. Obviously we haven't budgeted for that. Uh, see if we can fit this in this year. And Alex, it, you know, based on the uh, the progress on 88, you guys should be striping that here in a, in a matter of days. You know, are there gonna be any green, um, green hash marks on 88? Okay, so um, yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, we don't have any now. We are providing a a, a wider bike lane than than normal. Um, we talked about that a little bit. It wasn't our focus, uh, but th thanks, Neil, for bringing that up. I'll see if we, if we can uh, figure out how to do that. Yeah, we don't absolutely. Have, we don't. So, so Alex, just as I really like as a matter of practice, this, you know, committee to be engaged in every roadworks project. Mm -hmm. And while I appreciate everybody's voice, I'm going to listen to Matt and Alicia probably more than anybody else on this. So let's just make sure that any new construction, any construction, any roadway improvements we do, we absolutely want to take advantage. And I agree. I mean, the, the green striping is becoming the standard. Instead of looking to restripe it next year, why don't we just get it striped properly now? There's plenty of room. Yep. Right. The only, we, we only have the one intersection at, at Shamrock at this point. Um, and that we could add the, the green striping across Shamrock. We don't have uh, A and D lanes there. So uh, we don't Well, Alex, to... one of the reasons I brought it up is, you know, in the memo here, you know, there's a lot of discussion about the Main Street and the Castle Roundabout and the need to sort of redo how we stripe it and, you know, to alert the drivers to the, you know, how bikers should, you know, go through the roundabout. And since we are paving up to the roundabout, let's have this committee sort of examine that roundabout intersection as well, since you know, we are you know, going to be completing a $3 yeah, million dollar road we're, project. Uh... We're paving up to the island there. Okay. Unless you're right there. If you can point that, yeah, right, right there. That's yeah. where we're okay. stopping the pavement. Um, so I'll uh, I'll run that by the committee about our project and see if there's uh, recommendations for the, the green 
uh, the mixing zones. And Kevin, to that, that point about the green dashes, you're right, this is becoming more prevalent, more cities are developing, um, you know, scenarios and guidance on exactly where they put green striping. And we have to remember too that it's just like any new sign or those, you know, new neon yellow signs for a while where you totally noticed them and now a little bit less, they're still doing a pretty good job, but if you put it everywhere, people start ignoring it. And so developing the, McCaslin is pretty straightforward because it would in most cities fall into the, yes, we need the green striping. And so just to make sure that as we go through these, we as a committee, you guys as the broader, um, you know, transportation, um, consider to make sure that we don't put them everywhere, but put them in the most uh, impactful locations. Okay. So I, I just have some, I mean, I think Neil's bringing up a good point, but I want to talk about this committee itself. So, and I may have missed the memo. I was thrilled to read about the existence of the committee and the background for the TSC. How often are you guys meeting? Tell me, sort of how did we Alex this is something that the town that I've personally been advocating for so tell me about how we how we found you guys how we got you guys how often are we meeting um, I'm sure you guys are busy people are you volunteers are we giving you a stipend tell me what's going on here well uh, it was kind of an ad hoc group we wanted I wanted to get this group together because I knew we were going to be doing striping this year so I wanted to get their input um, on that so it was it was set up for that targeted purpose they i think enjoyed the experience um and uh we could make that i haven't talked to them about being a permanent committee and uh i did ask that the uh nonprofit organizations um that they uh, will give them a stipend for their participation in the work and of course uh, alicia with fox tuttle you know they get they get paid uh, as part right. of their their services so the nonprofits will be compensated for their time. Yeah, and Alex, Evan, I think if you, I think so, kudos to you for getting out there with creating this from an ad hoc perspective. I don't think it's going to be, you know, I don't think we have a board appetite to revisit the full committee structure, but a, you know, a subcommittee and somebody that's advising you exactly what we asked for, I think is great. If you provided a little bit of structure around that existence, around the existence of such a committee. I think the only person, the only thing that it's, you know, I personally wouldn't mind seeing uh, a superior resident. You know, there's a lot of superior residents that bike to Boulder or or Westminster every day, all year round, or at least they used to during normal times when we had offices. Um, and so it'd be interesting to get their perspective. And I also wouldn't mind getting the proverbial mom or dad that's out there that's spending a lot of time with their kids on the bikes because that's also just part of our brand. And so I'm thrilled this exists for the purpose of Striping McCaslin. As you think about the existence of a striping subcommittee or advisory, whatever, I, I, I you know, kudos, let's, let's give the nonprofits some type of stipend. And if we can get a couple volunteer members from the community, I think that would be perfect. Uh, uh, Neil, Laura, thoughts around that? Nothing, no, nothing to add. I think it's, I think it's, uh, I think at the function of a maturing town, um, we want to make sure we've got the most safe, um, just most safe transit for the bikes. And I think it's a great way to get there. I agree. Alicia, did you cover all the other recommendations on Main Street? Do we have a couple of changes there? Um, oh, the, that weren't shown on the map. So the, are these the ones you're talking about, the, the ones about um, right. approaching the intersections? Yeah, so we don't have um, plans showing these because they aren't going to the, or because they're different improvements than are going to the striper. Um, but talking about modifying the location of those greenback sharrows as they approach the roundabouts, um, in this one, you know, Colton Road, Main Street, Main Street was the one we were talking about. Um, but just providing a little bit more clarity, and I'll, I'll pull up, oh, goodness, wrong one. I'll pull up the, Ariel, 
if I can get it to agree with me here. Um, there was a discussion about, let's say coming in from the south, a bicyclist who's in this, this southbound, uh, sorry, coming in from the north, the southbound bike lane here, having a little bit of confusion because they see a bike off ramp, for lack of a better word. Um, it's called a bike ramp. And then also the Shero at the same time. And in reality, that's what is allowed for a bi from a bicyclist right. perspective. And some will hop off and some will go through. But talking about potentially moving this greenback Shero up a little bit so that the person who chooses to go through recognizes this is where I'm supposed to be, rather than seeing both of those inputs during a decision. And did I miss one on that one? Um, Oh, and just the signage to reinforce that bicyclists in the north in the roundabout should use the full lane as discussed. And that example that we can look at is same thing with the Shero, although the Shero is in a slightly different location. The sh I, Shero is that um, shared lane marking greenback. Right. Um, talking about modifying this signage here so that it's clear, you know, that up here. Um, you know, you can be in the lane, bikes may use full lane, and back here you may exit as a bicyclist. Um, the balance there that we were trying to strike was uh, not providing too much signage, um, both from the over signage perspective, but also from the, you have too many signs coming into a roundabout, and you can't see them all because they're actually physically, you know, cover each other up. So um, that, those were the basic recommendations on, on these. This, this Shero is a little bit further on than the Shero southbound um so you could scoot it further southbound even than this but it gives you at least a little bit better feeling of what it might look like yeah i mean i, I, I this sort of i don't i mean i think we're doing this right but we are sort of we do have our feet on both sides of the line right so when we designed this you know and i was on the board but i was commenting about it and when you look at all the roundabouts in aspen for example they are intentionally removing the cyclists from those roundabouts and they don't even give them a chance to be there, right? You'd have to physically carry your bike over something. I mean, there's people still do, but it's very challenging. It's for us, you know, I love the fact we built those sidewalks that are easily accessible or those multi-use lanes, paths, um, but it's, I, I feel like it, it is a little confusing to both the cars and the vehicles. So I want the vehicles to recognize that the bike has just as much a right to be in that lane as they do. And every time I've done it myself on a bike, I, I don't think the cars realize that. So we need to do, so. I, I wanted to be, I either feel like we, we need to do something. We either need to improve the signage or, and I hate to suggest it because I don't think cyclists will do it, just shut it down and force the cyclists onto the multi-use path the way they do in Aspen. Well, we have uh, certainly some food for thought for the committee to look at that right. issue. Um, I know, uh, just observing things, I see a lot of cyclists going through there. Yeah, that's what I pro but probably about 50-50, but yeah. that's part of the reason why, you know, the guy, you know, we've got a CU professor who rides every day, who mm -hmm. I see, and he always, every time he sees me in the grocery store, he grabs me and, you know, talks about his experience. I, I, that's why I'd love to get somebody like that on this committee, so. Yeah. And particularly, you have, you, I, I love your idea of the, and it's obviously up to you all and Alex of the superior resident, but in terms of bicyclist cross section, this um, committee that Alex has put together has a pretty big spectrum. I have a right. carbon fiber road bike and I also have a cargo bike that I ride two times a day, every day with my kids on it. So that, you know, we, and, and I know Matt has a breadth of experience in terms of usage and this type of application is a good example of where you are literally providing facilities for two different people. It's not necessarily providing two different options for one person, although technically it is. This is providing, I'm not going to get in that roundabout with my two kids on the back of my cargo bike, I'm going to get off, but Matt might not want to get off because 
he's going to run into Laura jogging on the path. Right. And so having the two options there is generally how most roundabouts are approached. But you're absolutely right that it's still, I, no matter how many roundabouts I go through, I still feel like a visitor, right, when I'm on, a, when I'm on my bike. Um, so this, the, the guy, regulations say you can't stripe a bike lane through a roundabout. Um, there are a few communities who are putting a share one around about that that gets really confusing because of lane assignment and things like that. So this seems, you know, from my, from my professional background to be the best balance of the two, but I can absolutely see both of those sides. And if I could just throw in my two cents, Alicia, I really appreciate the two examples you gave there because that basically typifies me with, you know, depending on which bike I'm on, you know, whether right. it's a mountain bike, with my mountain bike, I don't care what I'm rolling through. If it's on my road bike, I do not want to get off the roadway and onto a sidewalk. I mean, again, this gets back to the, the design point for the roundabout is to cut down on, you know, on accidents and facilitate the flow, but, you know, four-way stoplight would be better for a road biker than a roundabout. So, you know, if we're going to sub-optimize for the bikers to you know, keep things safer for cars, that's great. But I, I, I view it as a, an utter, you know, failure if we make every road bike have to get off onto the sidewalk. Because I, you know, just personally coming through there, it's a pain on a road bike to have to go through there and then across another intersection and then cross another intersection to get back on a McCaskey. Yeah. So, you know, it's, I mean, I, I understand where you're coming from, Kevin, but I would rather us find a way to allow, you know, at least exactly what Alicia said, you know, the two type of riders to come through there and optimize it the way that they want to. Really, for me, it's about driver education and less about bikers. You know, the drivers have to recognize the bikers can use that, that lane too. And I don't know how to do that. Yeah, no, I hear that. Okay. All right, uh, I'm gonna move on to the next item. And Alicia, before you leave, if you can uh, make me the host. <laughs> yeah, Excellent. see if I can do that. Let me uh, stop my screen sharing. And then, I don't think I've switched host back to you. Can you take it back? Mm -hmm. Can you take the host back? Uh, yeah, me? Alex, I think you could just start sharing whenever you're ready. Now the host, let's see. Can you do that, Alicia? I can't. When I click on it, I can't. Yeah, who can? Well, I'm going to say who can share. Um, okay, I just changed it. Who can share? So see if that works, because I'm actually not sure how to switch the host back to you. Let me go to the participant. Oh, I know how to now. I remember. Go to participant. There we go. Okay, your host. Assuming I assigned it to the right instance of you, I believe. Yes, it. you got it. Let's see if I can. Uh, okay. All right, I want to talk about the uh, Safer Main Street initiative. And, and Matt and uh, Alicia, thanks for all your help. I'll be in oh, contact nice. with you. Absolutely. Nice to meet you all. Thank Good to meet you. you. So um, we have a grant program that just came, came out, was uh, officially released on July 9th. It's called the Safer Main Streets Initiative. So it's, the focus is on, on safety. Um, and uh, the primary goals are to reduce fatal and serious injury accidents, support a transportation system that safely accommodates all modes of travel, improve transit access and multimodal mobility, uh, support development of connected urban employment centers and multimodal corridors, and provide safe access to opportunity and mobility for residents of all ages, incomes, and abilities. And finally, help communities adjust to the new normal travel patterns caused by COVID. 
I put this slide up just to show you, this is an interactive map of uh, Dr. Cog's high risk, high injury network. Um, and the, uh, the blue corridors are the uh, high risk corridors and the brown are the critical corridors. And I just wanted to show you Superior does not have any except for, for 128. So kind of a disadvantage, we don't, it's actually good. We don't, we don't really have corridors that we're getting a lot of high um, uh, risk accidents, high injury accidents. Or Alex, what are, the, what are the blue dots representing? Those are actually accidents. And I think okay. as you, as you uh, go in, you get more of them. So we can pull that out. So we do have some, but I think they're, I think they come up more as you get the network finer. Let's see. I didn't see it here, but, uh, and these may be, um, injury accidents, so we don't have a whole lot of injury accidents in, in Superior. So anyway, that's that's one of the criteria I think I gave you. The, uh, when they're scoring the uh, applications, the weighting will be uh, safety, will be 35%. Transit and enhan enhanced mobility, 25%. Technological innovation and benefit cost, 10%. Public support, local match, 10%. And readiness, 20%. I did want to also, they do are focusing or allowing uh, pedestrian uh, and bike facilities as, a, as uh, some example projects including sidewalks, crossings, pedestrian amenities, and protected bike facilities, pedestrian enhancements such as pedestrian activated actuated crossings, rectangular rapid flashing beacons, intersection crosswalk improvements, another category is traffic calming. Um, so they have a, a whole bunch dealing with traffic calming and pedestrian uh, enhancements and improvements. So it just came out. Um, I wanted to take some uh, potential projects to you. The deadline for applications is August 14th, so it's pr on a pretty short fuse. I didn't have much time to put this together, um, and it was hard to get to the town board to actually get their, their sign off. But uh, two projects that I put together, and there's there's probably several more if you want to talk about them. But, uh, the McCasin, Indiana roundabout, um, we just discussed. Maybe throw in the hat on that one. We did have a serious bike accident uh, for that. Uh, and that, and uh, you heard the bike lane uh, committee's recommendations uh, for a roundabout at that location. Um, quick cost estimate is about $2 million. Again, I've inflated that because of all the federal requirements. Uh, and that would require 20% uh, local match or 400,000. So that's a pretty uh, large project. And then the other project would be to uh, complete the US 36 bikeway extension. And then the memo I, I gave you, uh, let's see if I can put that Alex, for the bikeway extension, you know, you know, with the different pieces, A, B, C, and D, do we have an obligation for completing C by some period of time, you know, given the Dr. Cog funding for the, for A, B, and, well, and D? Well, it'll be by 2024. Okay. So, and if we, you know, by, by rights, if we don't get the federal funding here, then it's just 100% paid for by Town Superior. Right. It's been uh, it's something that 
is on our uh, back burner. At, at some point, we, we'd like to do that. Uh, we have a, is that up there? Okay. I mean, just to, to say it a little bit differently, Alex, to me, it's not really a back burner item so much as we have an obligation to complete it by 2024. If we get the funding. Well, no, that's, that's my question. If we don't get the federal funding, because we did receive the Dr. Cog funding for the other segments, do we have an obligation at any point to complete segment C, regardless of who's funding it? Mm -hmm. No. Okay. We are funding for A and D. We wrote a, a, a new scope. Originally, we applied for the whole amount. Right. We didn't get that, so we we changed the scope because we weren't going to get as, as much funding. So we said we want to do segments A and D, and for the the amount of money you gave us, and that that actually we have to get done probably by. Uh, beginning of 22, we hope to do it next year and have it all done next year. What is good about segment C to apply for is that it, that's pretty much shovel ready. We can say, hey, we we already have an IGA, we, ho we already uh, have this project scoped out. Um, it's an easy to amend the IGA rather than go through a three to six months negotiating uh, an IGA. So that's one of the reasons that to me was attractive. It's, they talk about shovel ready. They want to get the funding out and doing things for COVID-19 as soon as possible. And this is fairly easy to, to get out. The roundabout, we may have more difficult time doing it next year because it involves quite a bit of design work to be able to get, get that done. But, but this project here would be you know, very easy to, to, to put together. I appreciate that. I, I guess I, I mean, I, I was under the impression that you know, we did receive the Dr. Cog funding, but it came with a, you know, sort of a hook that you had to complete the rest of it at some point. But if we don't, that's, it is what it is. And I, I'm, I'm fully on board with completing this thing. I, you know, I, I think it's, I think it's sort of really important to have the bikeway actually connect as opposed to, you know, for two years, we're going to have bikers stranded on both ends of this thing. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, we've gotten a pretty good chunk with done by doing 88 this year. We have that, Right. That chunk done is going to be connected uh, to uh, segment A is going to be connected to seg segment B pretty seamlessly. And then we did extend the, the walk all the way down to, uh, there is an eight foot walk, that missing segment around the roundabout. There's already eight foot walk there that we can connect to. There was only a uh, five foot walk south of Shamrock and we decided to replace that and put that in now. So those are the two projects. Uh, you know, other ones, we had the 76 Sycamore project that we applied for a grant, um, uh, I think in 2018 or 2019. Uh, that didn't make the cut. Um, we don't have a whole lot of accident data up there, but that's certainly one we could put together. Um, you may talk about RRFBs. Um, I think Sandy Hamerly, uh asked, why didn't we do something on Marshall up by Costco, um, and that could probably be a RRFB up there, but it's it's probably 25,000, 50,000, if that. And, uh, Alex, what about the crossing, um, that weird crossing off of the other, you know, from in downtown Superior between Colton right by the mattress place? That. On Marshall? Oh, Marshall, I mean, did I say Colton? Marshall. We're taking that out. I know you're taking that out, but we, you know, we're taking it out because it's unsafe. But should we be thinking about putting in something that is safe there? Well, because we talked about, we talked about an underpass of Marshall. Uh, you know, Northwest cor Corridor Plan, if you remember the, uh, the plan we had there, we talked about uh, a better connection between original superior and, and the marketplace and putting an underpass. Um, that would be certainly a nice project to get federal funding for, but I think we would need to, to do some legwork and figure out what's possible, what's feasible and what, what the Yeah, I hear you. I'm just, it, you're, we, we wouldn't be able to do, the application wouldn't be very well received and it 
short amount of time for that. And, and that's something I think yeah, you're right. I, mean, I think to, to do it right, you need a great separation because we have signalized intersections and apparently that people don't feel safe at those intersections, but a nice uh, underpass would be nice and it'd be nice to, to uh, go a little farther and at least figure out what, what's feasible and what we need to do to, to make that happen. Right. But I think the two you suggested, I think are, from my perspective, I think those are the right two. Alex, you mentioned the uh, 76 and Sycamore and, and not having enough accidents, but what about you know, what we had talked about on Rock Creek Circle? You know, I know we've put up the speed signs and we've loaded the speed limit, but we did have a fairly lengthy list of other improvements that we wanted, whether it was RRB, you know, the uh, pedestrian crossing islands at Castle or Torrey's Peak, or even at um, Yarrow. Uh, there's a number of things, because I think we all acknowledge that the road is extraordinarily wide and we have mm -hmm. a lot of kids crossing into the summit. Well, I think, you know, we had, uh, initially we had some uh, concepts that were fairly expensive and and you TSC said wait like, we don't want to spend that much money now um, but we can certainly look at those and put together uh, we have a two hundred fifty thousand dollar minimum here for the grant um, so but if you package three or four intersections we could probably uh, do that um, again you're you're tearing up a new road over there too, so you got to consider that. But that's that's certainly something I, I kicked around. If you want, if you want me to pursue that, I can certainly make that another one. I mean, I, I like the two that you have on the list, no question. Um, you know, but if there's federal dollars out there and it looks to be about a three to one match, um, I'd be hesitant to to not pursue it as much as we could to really you know get the things that would have been out of reach for us from a budget perspective. Mm -hmm. Alex, my question for you is um, between the two of these, is there one that to you is more of a priority? Well, that's, uh, I think the Indiana McCasin is probably pick from your, safe. Pick your favorite child here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that certainly has more impact on safety, the Indiana McCasin one. Uh, it's, it, okay. Uh, you know, I'm torn because what what are our chances? Whether what's a high priority? What are our chances of getting funding? Um, right. Segment C, shovel ready. We can go in. Hey, we're going to spend this money, and we have a project that has already been approved. We didn't get enough funding for all of it. Um, this would cap it off and, and finish the project we originally intended. So, it, to me, that would be something, and it's and a smaller amount. The smaller projects, like they like to have everybody kind of share in things, but you get $2 million and you're, it's a big chunk out, out of $40 million. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I wouldn't mind putting in both and see where it goes. And I know it's probably one that you haven't scoped out at all, but I know that Sergeant Wolf had mentioned, you know, the increase of people running across McCaslin to get to the OR trailhead. Um, you know, that one's not going to be an easy one because you've got a massive, if we did want to add a, a pedestrian crossing there of some sort, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be expensive given the, the size of the island and the four lanes. Um, but if people are, are running across there because there's not a convenient, it's not easy to get to the, the signals up at the top of the hill or running down to the traffic circle, mm -hmm. like we need to get serious about how we're going to get people across the street. Right. That scares me to put, put a <laughs> RRP right there coming down the hill, but yeah. it's certainly something we should, we should look into. Or a, you know, barricade to prevent people from running across. I don't, I don't know. Okay. So if uh, I'll move forward with those two, does the committee want to bring that up with the board or just move forward? I mean, we don't really need town board approval. But I want to run this by you to, to get your, your feedback. I'll walk through. I, Alex, I, I think I'll walk, you know, if we were, we're not committing funding at this point, but we are exposing ourselves for a potential match of a couple hundred thousand dollars, 400,000 if we actually got funding. So I think it's certainly appropriate to let them know in 
but I, I don't think it needs to be a detailed agenda topic. But Neil, Laura, what do you guys think? I, I right. agree if, with you. If you could just bring yeah. that up in your committee reports, because I don't have anything scheduled for that. Just let them know we're moving forward. And okay, let's just make sure that it's also in the meeting minutes, Alex. So I'm not catching somebody. You you probably only have a, a a day, unfortunately, to get those in the packet for us. So sure. And then I'll I'll highlight uh, I'll bring it to their attention if somebody missed it in the minutes. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's see the committee project updates. Okay. So on uh, Torrey's Peak, we've uh, got the design for the uh, race crossing worked out. We're out getting pricing, uh, so that's moving along. We hope to do that. Uh, this uh, this fall, uh, we've been concentrating on 88. So as soon as we get that wrapped up, we'll move on to some of these other projects. Uh, Rock Creek Circle, we haven't done a whole lot um, in terms of the additional work on that. We'll be jumping on that this fall. On pending requests, we have uh, Yarrow Circle. We had originally had a neighborhood meeting scheduled back in March which we canceled because of the COVID crisis. And then uh, we're targeting fall. I, I hope to have an in-person meeting, but it doesn't look like that's gonna be possible unless you guys know we're gonna be doing that. So I would, I would say we're gonna move forward with virtual meetings for both Yarrow Circle and Riverbend to at least uh, meet with them and not keep them hanging on. I think it's appropriate. Thank you. And then we, re we did receive one new request on, on El Dorado Drive from Firestone Way to Graydon. And there's a- uh, Interesting. Yeah, I thought that was an interesting request, Alex. I mean, I never, I mean, that's probably, I probably drive that as much as anybody, right? Because it's, how I get out of town. I, I, I don't remember seeing a I mean, if I read, the, I looked at it pretty quick, but the request is for traffic coming on El Dorado, correct? That's correct. And it's really a tight curve. I think maybe it's a little blind corner. Um, you do have, um, you know, as you go north on El Dorado, you have a three uh, hallway stop, but uh, there's a Coleridge. And then as you go to the uh, west, you have a, a raised crossing not too far away. Uh, so there's about 1,200 feet between traffic calming features, and then you have a curve itself. So I think what we'll do is go out, evaluate, collect, collect uh, speed and volume data, maybe look at some of the physical geometry out there um, to see what would be possible. But it's, you know, request that came in on our uh, on our typical form so we'll we'll process it uh, with the the normal way we do data collection and community outreach alex just a curiosity question more about you know our checklist <coughs> and the, the toolbox i mean i know paint is cheap and you know when when you've thrown down the yellow sort of line on some of the blind corners around town whether it was waldona or andrews I know it's been effective at keeping people on their side of the street and helping to slow them down. Um, I don't know if there's an opportunity to do that here while you're doing data collection as well. Not to influence the data, but you know, like you said, it is a blind turn. And I've, you know, I've run through there a lot. You've got the two raised intersections you know, for the paths you know, to the west. Mm -hmm. And you get this 1,200 feet before you hit the, uh, the three-way intersection. So, I mean, it's a goofy turn. I mean, it's just mm -hmm. everything we've, <laughs> a lot of the things on the south side or the north side of of Colton are just you know goofy in terms of the way they got laid out. Right, and that could be what ends up. You know, if you have a curve there, then you're probably going to have slower speeds that don't require uh, speed humps that you know, would really slow them up. But I agree, something like yellow paint. I see the yellow paint with the buttons, but that's more uh, in a uh, climate that doesn't have snow and ice. What do you mean yellow? I don't know what you mean yellow paint. Oh, oh, right, to slow down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you mean now. I'd like to ask a question, please. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Who's who's on the line? Stan Jarrett, I'd like to ask Alex a question on agenda item number six, please. Sure. Okay. Um, you mentioned um, wanting to do something as far as the Riverbend Act Run request. Did you have a time frame that you were thinking of having a virtual uh, meeting uh, figured out yet? Uh, we were thinking after school is back in session. I hope they get back in session. Everybody's back. Uh, so we're looking at maybe late September, early October. Um, and we'll, we'll work with your group uh, to try to look for some dates that would work. Um, but we, you know, we put you off because we haven't made, had the ability to, to meet in person. Uh, but I think we have to just carry on and do the virtual meeting uh, and present the information that we've collected in terms of uh, data and so forth. So we'll be in contact with you. I think he dropped off. Did he drop off? May have lost him. Okay, he's been the group. He's been one of the ones on Riverbend Akron. Okay, but Alex, I mean, I think we, should, you know, we we've been in a pandemic long enough now that virtual meetings are kind of a normal course of business. We're not going back to in person anytime soon. I, you know, I think it made sense to put it off for a couple months, but we've been locked in our homes now for six months. Let's mm -hmm. let's get this on for September at the latest, please. Okay, so we'll look at late September early October and uh, I'll get some dates out to work with the neighborhood group to, to pick an appropriate date and then uh, we'll get a mailer out to uh, all, all the people on that on those streets to uh, invite them to that meeting. Does that answer your question? Are you back on? We lost it for a minute. Is yeah, I, I dropped off. Yeah, I'm, I'm back on. Yeah, what we just did is Kevin, what we, what we 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 asked Alex to so thank you for your patience there, you know we've now been I, uh, I think thank I said we've been locked. Uh, yeah, I, I, we're going to try to get uh, this scheduled. Not somebody. try, we will have it scheduled. Thank you. Okay, um, and then the final item was uh, on lowering the residential speed limit to twenty, and I started putting together information that we could uh, put on our website in terms of background of why we're, why we're doing this, considering it. Uh, we had some, some rationale behind uh, the uh, risks of surviving an accident uh, at various speeds. I think you've seen those graphics before. We have potential for putting uh, crash and speed data on there. Uh, graphics showing what roads would be affected. Um, so I would propose putting that on a special web, web page on our website. And then uh, I start drafting um, a mailer to go out um, seeking input. And then in terms of a, an opinion survey, again, this isn't my strong point, but like input from you. I, yeah. I, so Alex, I, I, I don't want to workshop this survey. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think maybe if you could just work with, I think Leslie has built some strength here yep. in surveys. Mm -hmm. um, and so maybe work with her on this. I think the, you know, just right off the bat, even in the letter, you know, where it says the transportation and safety committee is considering reducing the speed limit. This committee obviously doesn't have the authority to reduce the speed limit or do anything else, right? So if I'm okay. a recipient of that, I'm going to say, well, wait a minute, you know, here comes government. And that's not at all the case. You know, we're considering, uh, I, and I don't know what the right words are. And, I, and if you want, I could, I can workshop it with you. I just don't want to do it in a public meeting. Um, after I've sat at my computer for 11 hours so far. <laughs> um, but I think Leslie's excellent at it. It just needs to be workshopped a little bit. So mm -hmm. I suggest just make sure that we're, engage in the town to receive feedback in consideration of type of language. Um, and then just a minor net, I really appreciate that you're putting your name out there in the, in the community. I would just make sure it's, you know, feedback at superiorcolorado.gov or sure. 20s plenty or something. Let's not, you know, hopefully that lottery ticket is going to pay off for you this week and 
you know, we won't see you next week. So let's just, I like to, I like to avoid names um, in, in emails, just a personal net. Sure. But anyway, but I, I mean, I love the idea of it. I think that the resident survey, um, I think keeping it pretty simple, you know, do you live here? Yes. You know, and maybe a couple other, and the reason why you ask demographic information isn't because, you know, we're trying to figure out what part of your, you want to slice and dice the data based around that demographic information. So is serve even the most fundamental free serving uh, uh, instances will allow you to, you know, okay, 86% uh, of superior residents south of Colton support a uh, speed limit reduction, but only 70% north of Colton will. If we might want to ask a few qualifying demographic type details, just to better slice and dice the data uh, for us. But I, I, keeping it simple, I think is the most important thing. And right. let's not and pretend like this survey, nobody's going to publish this, the results of this survey in the Traffic and Safety Journal of Engineering. You know, mm -hmm. it's just data. It's just interesting it's it's one of many data points that we'll consider and so don't get too lost on the science but a few more qualifying questions i think would be great that's why i did ask for location what at least what street not their actual address so we could have an idea of where where they're living what part of town yeah i think yeah. i think to kevin's point though some of our streets are un unusually lengthy like elder Road drive is a perfect example of right. where you've got three different neighborhoods that sort of live right. along Eldorado Drive. So. And so maybe regions, you know, do you, you know, which region yeah. do you live in and you put a, the map out there, you know, you don't want A through N feels overwhelming, but if we could do, you know, maybe five, I don't know how many to do Alex, but that's why, I mean, it, that it, this just feels like you've done, you've started the work and I think it's great. And, and, this is by far, the, I think, the best meeting we've had in a while because we're, we've made some really good progress. But this just needs a little bit, you know, a, a little and, bit more. And I think to, to Kevin's point, uh, Leslie has done something like this with ProStack a year ago, or maybe it was two years ago, a year ago, the Riverbend, um, uh, sort of the Riverbend playground right. uh, yeah. survey. I think they did slice the town into a handful of zones right. to try to get right. um, some alignment. And we, maybe we could just recycle that, that zoning. Mm -hmm. Sure. Laura, okay. you're on mute. Wait, Laura. I am on mute. Fix yes. it. Sorry. Um, I think it ends up going into like 10 zones, and I think that's a reasonable number. It gives us the right number, the right amount of granularity without necessarily, um, you know, being too detailed for people. What other demographic do we want to, I personally don't care whether or not somebody is a renter or an owner. I think that's in a way almost, in a, in, I don't want to say inappropriate, but it doesn't, it doesn't impact my thinking. Um, how long have they lived here? You know, kind of zero to three, three to seven type of thing might be interesting data. In what zone, you know. You know, and it's, it's not like there's an easy question. I'm sorry, Laura. Um, it's a question of ultimately, how do people use the roads? Is it predominantly by car or is it by bike? Is it by walking? You know, if we can get some level of detail on how people are actually using our roads. Yeah. I think that's a great, I'm, I'm much more interested in how people are using the roads. And I, I'm not as interested in how long have people lived here. And um, to me, that's a little bit, it's a little bit like the owner renter question of right. dismissing people who are newer. So I, I don't think that's as relevant. You know, even if, some, if someone has been here six months and they're going to leave in another six months, we can probably assume they're a similar demographic as the person who's going to move into that house six months later. So I, I think we don't need the answer to that one. That's a pretty uh, complex question there, Neil, because people are, they drive, they bike, and they. Well, you know, they maybe walk, it's right? a, you know, maybe it's you quantify, you know, for what percentage of your travel is by car, 
versus bike versus walking. I, I agree. Yeah. And, and that the reason I hesitated because there's not an easy question that lends itself to it. But, you know, if I were to just peg myself, I'd probably use the roads 80% of the time with a car and the other 20% is on foot. Um, you know, I use the bike ways for the, with my bike. I don't use my, I don't ride the roads with my bike anymore because I'm scared. But fundamentally, you know, I don't use the roads, you know, 100% of the time with my car. So. Yeah, but I think it's an interesting, I, I do, I mean, this is why it needs to, I, I think, I, I know you guys are in, in different, uh, on different teams, Alex, but I think Leslie will enjoy, I hope she enjoys working with you on this. And as I said, I'm happy to do so as well. But and Neil, I mean, I think you might be onto something. And we've got, to, I think this is our last agenda. Item. So we've got a few minutes to talk about it. Um, but I think you might be onto something, you know, the question might be, you know, describe the best way, describe how you use the local streets in the town of Superior. You know, question A, driving exclusively. Question B, you know, mostly driving um, and some walking, you know, to, you know, I use it for, you know, the, the, there would be an answer, you know, I don't have a vehicle. I only use the road for alternative methods of transportation, which could include bike or, or walking. Mm -hmm. And see if we can get the data. And I suspect, I mean, our, my spec, the hypothesis here, of course, is people that are going to be pro automobile are going to say, don't reduce the speed limit. And the people that are going to say, I, and I'm one of these people, I think roads are not just for cars. I think roads are for throwing footballs and frisbees and skateboards. I'm sorry, but that's how, and I'm not suggesting it's safe, but that's how I think. That's how I think. And I'm a strong advocate for reducing the speed limit for a shared use type of environment. But asking a question is sort of unpack what is your perspective around a shared use and then getting data around how many of our residents in the town of Superior might think like me, and I'm here to represent them, not my own thoughts, versus might think more in a traditional roads are for vehicles thought. So I, I think it is a good idea to ask a question around that, Neil. I don't know how to phrase it yet, but I think you're on to something. Another so way the only to thing I'm approach it with that, and, and maybe I'm applying the similar to me bias here, but as I think about my own habits and as I think about the people I know, I would imagine that most people are going to say they use a mix. Um, and I'm trying to think, I don't know that there's really a good way to quantify exactly how many bike trips somebody takes versus how many you know, car trips and walking trips. I know Kevin and I, for example, have very different habits. I don't get on my bike much. And I know, Kevin, you bike around a lot. Um, but I, even, even though I tend to be more car or running, I don't think that there would necessarily be a meaningful difference in how that shapes. Do we want 20 is plenty or 25? I, I, I don't know. Well, I'm trying came to, to mind. Just to just let me add this in here real fast because one of the ways to sort of get the data is just ask how many people, how many miles do people put on each of their cars, right? How many cars does the household have, or how many vehicles does the household have, and then how many miles do they get per year per car, per vehicle, right? One of my cars gets ten thousand miles, like probably like tw eighteen thousand miles a year. The other car, car probably gets three thousand miles per year. So I'm the one doing a whole lot of driving in and out of town when I have to commute to work. Um, obviously this is pre-COVID, but you know, the point is, you know, people that drive a lot might have a different perspective versus the ones that don't. And that might help us get to segmenting out who's using the roads more and what their feeling is about speeds. But we don't know that that mileage adds up to trips in Superior. Yeah, For example, true. like I put, I put a ton of miles on my car heading out to my mountain house in Vail, but only one mile of that in is in out. Superior. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, there, so, it's a, yeah, it's a good question. I, I, I kind of, I mean, I really would like this to be as short a survey as possible, um, just so that we can get more people to respond. Um, I mean, I'm thinking about the survey that ACES has put out around recycling, and um, it's pretty lengthy, and I think it's a lot of really valuable information so I think there can be a strong case made for the questions that they've asked, 
but if we if we don't have a strong case for a question, my inclination is to leave it out. And if we see, for example, if we did figure out that half the town, you know, uses their cars 100% of the time and half the town 50%, clearly I'm simplifying here. Um, I don't know that that would, I don't know that that would shape my decision in terms of how I look at the responses. Um, because I'm not going to discount part of the town because of that background information. Yeah, Laura, I mean, a big part of what I'm also trying to do is, you know, when we started this conversation a year or two ago, there were some, there was some surprisingly vocal opposition to this. And I'm trying to understand, and it's the squeaky, and I don't know if there's a, uh, if that vocal opposition is, I suspect it's going to be, a, I don't want to say, it, it was a very loud vocal opposition. I just don't know how to quant what the quantity is, nor do I know why there was opposition. Because if you run, even if somebody's making three or four grocery trips a day, which hopefully nobody is these days, this adds 30 minutes maximum to your year. I mean, I don't personally understand the opposition from a convenience. I understand that there's people like me that don't like the government telling them what to do and i'm but speed limits and safety sort of fall into the category of okay somebody needs to tell us how to behave and what's lawful and unlawful and this feels like an appropriate measure for the improvement of safety because i go back i anchor to the to the statement that our roads are so poorly designed and i'd love nothing more than to spend 25 million dollars redesigning all our roads so they're uh, so people will slow down, but nobody's going to give us $25 million or whatever the number is. And so what, I mean, what, are, what are the other tools? And I'm trying to figure out why the opposition. And that's what I was hoping on. Right. So I think with that, I mean, the simplest way is to ask, why did you answer this way? And have yeah. like a one or two short answer. Not everyone will fill it out. And I think that's okay. But if we make that an optional question at the end around explain your, your rationale or whatever else, I think we'll get enough data that will start, I think we'll get enough responses that will get to that answer. And I think we'll get to it in a better way than trying to guess based on these other multiple choice questions. Actually, Laura, you you're want... right. I think we had a text field in the, uh, the Riverbend yeah. survey and that had a lot of <laughs> you know, relatively, you know, some were painful, but some were uh, really helpful comments. Yeah, I think it's a good point, Laura. Let's just put, add the text field, you know. Put, a, put an open because question, I, any of the comments, or why did you, uh, why do you feel yes or no? Yeah. And have have yeah. A, an opportunity for them to express whatever comments they have. Yes, I, I think I would prefer that it's a, you know, explain or why or something like that rather than any other comment. Um, Again, making it optional so they don't have to explain their thinking if they don't want to. But I think that way, hopefully, it will encourage people to respond. I mean, when I, whenever I'm in, whenever I'm looking at what we're hearing from the community, I, I know I've said this like a broken record, but for me, it's not a vote. You know, if 90% of the people say A and 10% say B, but the people that or B have strong rationale behind it. That's what's more important to me is what's right. that rationale. Yeah, that's what I was trying to say, Laura. Better articulated. Okay. It's, it's a long day, Kevin. <laughs> well, thanks for the feedback. I think we got a couple other people on on the call. Is that Troy Roof? Troy Wolf? Or is that I see Judy Wolf on there? That's, yes, that's me. I was using her. Okay, Troy. <laughs> you had a comment there. I, I, the only thing I was thinking of is, I don't know if it'd be appropriate or not to ask how often people adhere to the speed limit that's in place in the house. That would be great. <laughs> how many well, miles an hour do you I, normally travel over the speed limit? <laughs> well, the other thing, you know, Alex, I know it's expensive, but nobody likes the fact that this, these data are already available because we all drive and go on walks and bike rides with our phones. And so if we really want to start purchasing the data to figure out exactly how far, how fast people are driving 
within our community, I mean, there's another, there's a slightly, there's a different way to, to do that, you know, without setting up the, um, you know, the speed zones and things like that. We could just buy the data. Mm -hmm. So I think one thing Mr. Wolf's question gets to that, that I would be really interested in understanding. I don't think people will be honest about, you know, do you speed or not, because everyone thinks that we're gonna start giving tickets out based on that. Um, but I do think people might be honest if we said, you know, how often do you look at the speed signs as you're driving through the neighborhood? Um, one of the pieces of feedback we got on Coal Creek Drive, um, I think, now I can't remember if it was Coal Creek Drive or if it was Rock Creek Circle, but one of those, when we changed the speed limit, we didn't immediately put those flags up to kind right. of draw attention to it. And we had a lot of that feedback saying, oh, I didn't even notice the speed limit change. I drive that road every day, so I don't think to look at the speed limit on it. Um, so maybe a question like that would be more valuable, or maybe we skip it. Maybe, again, I, I want this to be short and sweet so people respond. It's a tough question. What about the, uh, the ticket issue and enforcement? Um, I'm just worried, uh, I think, Kevin, you mentioned it, that we make all of a sudden we were now targeting people that are breaking the law that they didn't before. Um, short choice, they're not going to be enforcing this um, right away, but all of a sudden we have young drivers and so forth. Now they're getting points on their record for. Yeah, I, I, Alex, I can't, I'm really looking, you know, you, you, you have a strong point of view that, that you convinced me that people drive the speed limit that the road that the road allows for, and that's what the 85th percentile tells us, right? And so I think we now have, uh, because we've changed the speed limit on a couple roads, we're going to be able to have some some data, and it's not a ton of data points, but we're going to have a couple data points to basically tell us whether or not that in the town of Superior, the change in the speed limit can change behavior. I like to think that changing the speed limit will change the behavior for a number of our residents. There will, of course, always be outliers, just like there's outliers everywhere. Um, and the issue of enforcement, I think, is going to be a separate separate issue. But it doesn't mean that, I, I you know, I it's, it's a question. But we're, you know, I think as we've talked about this and we're going to talk about it a lot more, I personally will, am going to be reinforcing a message this is not about reducing the speed limit and then getting Sergeant Wolf and his team sort of together with, okay, we're going to, we're going to, uh, you know, increase the revenues for the town. That's never come up in a conversation and that's not at all what we're doing. This is about safety and we can't redesign the roads and we're trying to make this safer for our kids and for our families. And we're all staying home a lot more these days. And we think this is a trend that other communities have seen success. And so before we deploy it in the town of Superior, and maybe we will, maybe we won't, we want your feedback. But it's not, but if the question is, you know, is this about town of Superior trying to get more revenue? Heck no, not at all. It's never even come up. Will it be enforced? Well, like all things, within our code there will be some level of enforcement for things in our code but not everybody that drives five miles an hour over the speed limit gets a traffic ticket every time you do so not every code is enforced 100 percent of the time of course and you know i think uh laurie you mentioned coal creek drive like so you know i think that's a great example of where we took it from 35 to 25 and I would like to see some data now that it's more than a year since we've changed the speed limit because my own anecdotal information is the people that live here are driving 25 and the ones that don't live here who are rushing to a construction site or a lawn job or FedEx, they are driving the speed that the road can handle. Um, you know, I think it's just anecdotally, I think, you know, the people that live here will adhere to the signs and the, the ones that don't or that you know, are in here relatively infrequently they're not paying as much attention to what the signs actually say. They just kind of busting through. Sure. So I think, you know, from the perspective of, you know, what are the behaviors we want this community to embrace? Let's lower the speed limit where it makes sense. And yeah, we'll see how it goes. Okay. 
I'll uh, redraft. I'll work with Leslie's group, and uh, we'll keep going on this, and we'll let you uh, look at anything before I send it out. So. Yeah, please. please. There, we've, we've had a couple of hiccups on surveys, and then, mm -hmm. you know, so it's one of those things, Alex, it's, even though it seems we're going to do it, and then we want to test it, you know, can it be done on a mobile device? You know, we had this issue. Can you see it on a mobile device? Can you see it on IE? For some reason, people still use IE. You know, let's test a couple different modalities. Okay. Al Alex, do you have a target? I mean, the, the memo says, you know, we'll look at the data in the December TSC meeting, but do you have a target date that you want to put this survey out? Yeah, I'm looking, uh, well, you ask me, we have an election coming out and you want to, Put it out after the election so we don't stir people's feelings up, or it doesn't matter. Well, Laura and I, we're not up for elections, so you know, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I, I personally am here for you know, the sooner we can get this out, I think the better. I hope so I too. I mean, Alex, the only, the only, I don't think it was fair to get it. I, I, it's business as usual for the town, with the possible exception of you know, Matt can make a decision on an important development application to. Right. maybe hold something that that but business as usual let's do things with appropriate speed election right. shouldn't hold that up yeah. i'll just move forward with with refining this and uh getting it out making sure you're comfortable and then when it's ready we'll we'll get it out yeah it should uh, i think you're a couple hours away i think it's great yeah. great work yeah. alex i can't thank you enough for getting the cyclists together i mean that's just to me it's just so impactful i do want to talk about one more thing uh, just to walk it on. Alex, I don't know how, I'm I'm starting to think about something. I want to give you a heads up. I don't know if I'll be prepared to, prepared to talk about it, but I'm thinking about proposing an addition to the town code that will impact you. And that addition to the town code would be anytime we were doing road construction. And I think we have a practice around this, but I want it to be part of the code that there will be clear signage for cyclists including dedicated flaggers, separate roadways, clear signage. I don't want to speculate on the reasons why what happened in Louisville happened, but the town in practice, our practice in the town of Superior is fantastic. And Alex, I think you and the team have done a nice job, but we got a lot of roads to rebuild in the next 10 years. And the three of us may not be on the board. And I'd like to see code that requires future board members and future employees to follow that same best practice that you've established, which is we're not a car first community, we're cars, bikes, and cyclists, and let's put it in the code and have that codified forever or, or until somebody changes it. <laughs> yeah, no problem. So I haven't figured out a way to articulate it. I don't know the proposed language, but um, it's, I don't, you know, we could talk about it at TSC and I think you guys know the history and why I want to do it, but I, I, I think it's incredibly important as all these roads need to get rebuilt and we're, we cannot be cars first. No. Sure. I, I have no problem with that. Okay. Uh, one thing I, I have in terms of data collection, uh, we've had a practice here every, um, uh, five years to do uh, coverage traffic counts so we collect you know throughout the town and you've seen some of the, the traffic maps that we put out with traffic counts uh, and then I always like to do it during the census year in case we want to correlate any of the traffic growth you know look at various roads whether they're increasing or, or decreasing but we've had this COVID crisis normally we do it in April of, of the uh, census year to coincide when the census is taken. Well, I, obviously the traffic was down 40, 50% at that point. So I, I put that off. We have a contractor that had bid on that and I put him off and I was gonna do it in the fall. Any sense, do you wanna just hold off till things come back? We're still down 30, 40%, I would think. And I, I, I think businesses, I go back to the business as usual, Alex, and I think you know, superior historians will look at the data uh, that you'll have 20, 30 years from now, and mm -hmm. they'll see in 2020, there was a 30% reduction compared to 2015. Mm -hmm. And then they'll say, oh yeah, that was during the pandemic. 
I, I, let's capture the data. Mm -hmm. But I don't okay. think we dismiss data because of that. I, I think you capture it. I don't know. What do you, Neil, Laura, what do you guys think? I agree. I actually, I, I like the, the perspective you put on it, Kevin. I mean, we're, we're not going to stop everything. The data will be, you know, slightly different. But, you know, I think when we were looking at 88 Street as part of the uh, FTP a few weeks ago, we did acknowledge that the data that we had from 2015 was slightly anomalous because of the DDD um, construction. Yeah. And I think that's the way we might look at the 2020 data as, as being somewhat off. But I think on a percentage basis, it should be relatively consistent. So I'd say you know, full steam ahead. Yeah. So we have it set up. So I'll probably do it in uh, late September, early October to make sure school's in session. Hopefully they're uh, whatever the conditions are, but do it in the fall when we have kind of the peak conditions, peak traffic conditions. Yeah. That's perfect. And Alex, okay. for, for the audience at home, how's 88th coming? Well, the, the bottom lift is, uh, is paved uh, and we're getting ready to uh, do the segment from Shamrock down to uh, the roundabout. So that's going to require some different travel patterns, especially for the Reliance Circle residents that now will either have to park on Enterprise or if they want to go to work, uh, they would have to go through Louisville. Uh, they will be using that. Um, but we've had a re remarkable run of luck with uh, traffic volumes being down, being able to close the road, and then the, the weather being fantastic for, for road construction. So, um, yeah, we're, we're wrapping it up in, in two weeks. We'll have it uh, uh, all paved. The only question we faced uh, today was whether, um, you know, we have all that dirt and stuff on the east side that we want to clean up. And I didn't feel like having, I wanted to make sure it got cleaned up before we did the final paving. And they asked about putting it off. I said, no, no, we're not putting off the paving. And, but if we dirty the road, we'll sweep it up. And, but it's, it's all, it's all uh, on schedule to, to have the top left paving the end of next week and, and open it up before the weekend of uh, next week. So it'll be the 14th uh, to have the final striping then done. Right. Given the, the lack of noise complaints we've had, I assume that uh, that's a good thing. So usually when things, when there's disruption, you know, I mean, this is, you know, think about last summer with Colton, you know, how many just ticked off emails we got, right? I mean, mm -hmm. this is just different, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. You guys have gotten, have they been complaints about traveling around? It seems like it, it's gone pretty smoothly. Just in my own household. <laughs> <laughs> I think every time I have to I, drive through Broomfield I, and hit the 18 red lights, um, you know, that's when I, you know. They, they can see what other jurisdictions do in terms of traffic signal timing, right? I sort of uh, murmur something under my breath. I will say I just keep forgetting even now and <laughs> I'll get there and I'm like, oh, that's right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think it's great. I've I heard a couple anecdotes about uh, people riding their bikes over and that seems to be working well. So, you know, it's great. Actually, you know what, um, Kevin, thanks for reminding me. Uh, the, the, the crew did a phenomenal job when they kind of had, had to tear up the intersection of 88th and, and promenade of creating a temporary bike trail. It, it was great. You know, I used it like 20 times, you know, it was a mm -hmm. bunch of crushed rock. Um, mm -hmm. and they did a fantastic job of keeping us moving through. So, um, kudos to, you know, I think we asked for that six, nine months ago and you guys have done a great job of following through and ensuring mm -hmm. that, you know, bicyclists have a way to get through. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, great. All right. Well, thanks a lot. I don't have anything else. Like, is there another person on there that we haven't heard from? Any other thanks. public comment or questions? Guess not. So, all right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good evening. Bye. All right. Bye, everyone. Take care. Thanks.